Hey, Art Nerds! Today I wanted to share something really cool with you guys. This was inspired by a lot of conversation in my Discord server, The Paint Box. We were talking about using alcohol markers on top of cellulose-based watercolor paper for certain effects. I've used alcohol markers on watercolor paper with watercolors for years. It's one of my favorite techniques and I do have a few tutorials here on this channel that demonstrate how I like to do it, but I wanted to create another tutorial today to further inspire you guys. So I'm using the Dora Art round watercolor block. I just love the format of this thing. It's not the best watercolor block ever, but it's round and it's cellulose paper. Now there are round blocks available, but there's something about the cellulose paper with markers that I happen to really like. So I reviewed this in the past. I'll drop a link to the review as well as to the field test down in the description below. I hope you guys will check it out. That was ordered from AliExpress. I'm also using a variety of alcohol markers. I know in some of my tutorials, particularly the ones about Copics, it seems like I just use Copics, but I basically use any alcohol markers that are fairly decent. I've reviewed a lot of alcohol markers over the years, so I have quite a collection of favorites. And basically, if you've got a rubber brush tip and you're half decent, you're probably going to end up squirreled away in my collection. So you'll see Copics, you'll see Blick Studio brush markers, you'll see Curry Color, and you'll see, um, I think it's Neo Color as well. In fact, I have a list of the colors that I'm using today. I'll have that down in the description below, but I'll also read it out to you guys. So for Kara's skin, actually, let's start with the whites of the eyes, the flowers, the shirt, etc. I'm using Copic B quadruple zero, Copic B triple zero, Copic B double zero, and Copic B 23. So you guys can see I've already started using that. For Kara's skin, I started with Blick Studio Brush 095, then I went over it with Copic E00, and then Copic E11. And then I introduced some blush colors. I used Blick Studio 079, Copic E93, and Copic R02 for the br blush. And you can see I'm starting to integrate some of the blush now. Now, one of the really nice things about using alcohol markers on cellulose paper, especially cellulose watercolor paper, is it's a little bit more absorbent. It's a little bit thirstier, so you're gonna be able to get a lot of really nice blends on it. It also has really nice texture to it, and it allows for mixed media work. And one of the beautiful things about cellulose watercolor paper is it tends to be pretty cheap, so it's a very accessible product. You can get, I think they're a knockoff of this pad, but you guys can let me know. You can get pads similar to this one over on Amazon if you're not comfortable with using AliExpress or you're impatient and you want it sooner rather than later. But I've been more than satisfied with this pad and I would recommend it to anybody who wants to use a cellulose-based round watercolor pad like this one. So for the strawberries, I'm starting out with a really, really light color. I'm starting with Copic R33. Then I'm moving on to Blick Studio Brush 064. Then Blick Studio Brush 019. Then Copic R29. Then Copic R46. And then finally Copic R39. And this is one of the reasons I generally don't give you guys the colors that I use when I'm using doing a marker tutorial where I use a bunch of different brands is I don't expect you guys, A, to try and replicate this piece. I just want to inspire you guys to make your own art and share some of the tools I've found over the years. And I want you to work with the colors you have with the brands you have. It doesn't matter if you're using Copic or Ohuhu or if you're using Crayola. It doesn't matter. What matters is the skills you use and how you learn to use the products. And with like the water, uh, sorry, the alcohol markers we're using today, they're all alcohol-based brush tip markers. So I'm gonna use them all in basically the same way and I use them together interchangeably. So the dress and her hair bow uses the same colors as the strawberries. I wanted to kind of reflect that red. I probably should have left it lighter. I probably went a little too dark with it. I should have kept it pinker and that would have been a nice accent but I started with a base of Copic R000. 
And what this also does is it creates a base tone. So when you layer your colors on top of it, you're not working from the white of the page, you're working from a base color. And this is one of the reasons I generally recommend using tone papers as well, is it gives you a really nice base to start off from. Now, if you've never worked with tone papers, I've got some videos here on the channel to inspire you. And if you're new to alcohol markers and you're looking for tips on selecting skin tones or selecting hair tones or applying blush and shadow colors, I've got you covered there as well. Those playlists will be down in the description and they'll also be linked in the card. So keep an eye out for that. So my main marker technique is apply color and then blend it out with the color that came before. So it's not a difficult technique. It's not really a very special technique. It's a pretty basic technique, but it does require a little bit of patience. And my goal with this is to build up the strawberries to be darker and a bit more luscious than the dress itself. So we're gonna go a little bit darker with R46 and R39. With this piece, I'm not really applying any shadow colors or any contrast colors for shadow using the markers themselves. I'm mainly working with local color that is the color of the actual object under sunlight and just working with darker shades of that. Now, when I introduce the watercolor, which is the second part of this tutorial, and I'll be using the Core Mini palette for that, I will start introducing contrast colors for that. So for Kara's hair and eyes, I am using Copic E97, Copic E08, Copic E09, and Copic 47. And I'm using the same technique with the exception. So generally when I'm applying color and I want a really soft blend, I work wet into wet kind of like with watercolor, where I don't really give my alcohol inks a chance to dry before I apply the next layer. But when I want like shiny highlights, like with hair, I work wet over dry. So I apply my wet alcohol marker, the juicy alcohol marker on top of marker that's already had a chance to dry and the, the alcohol has evaporated out of the paper. Now on a cellulose watercolor paper like this one, it does take a little bit longer, but it's not too bad. And for her freckles, I used Copic E23 and Copic E34. For the interior of the flowers, the little sunshiny yellow, I'm using a Copic sketch that's been filled with Ranger sunshine yellow, speaking of that. And did you guys know that if you buy empty Copic sketches, which are available, you can fill them with the alcohol inks of your choice? That includes the Ranger and Jacquard inks. It's a great way to get some unusual colors in your collection. I also used Copic Y18 and Blick Studio 009. So for the leaves, I'm starting with a base of Copic G00, which is a really light minty green. Then I'm going over it with Blick Studio Brush 067 and then Copic G17. And then finally, I'm gonna add the darker shadows with Copic G28. For the stems, I started with Blick Studio 042, which is like a really, really bright chartreuse green. And then I went over it with Copic YG63. And I'm leaving some rim lighting between our Copic G00, that really light minty green, and the first application of Blix 067. And that just kind of gives some atmospheric lighting. It kind of gives a little bit more dimension to the leaves themselves.
So for each subsequent layer of marker, I'm rendering less of the leaf and trying to keep in mind the direction of the sunlight and that the sun would be hitting these leaves. And this is going to allow me to build up some lighting, some volume, and a bit of contrast. And I drew and I rendered this piece because generally I like going out strawberry picking. Um, we don't, well, we've tried growing strawberries for years and have never really had a lot of success growing them at home, but there were loads of strawberry farms back when we lived in Savannah and then when we lived in Nashville. Unfortunately, this year with COVID, it just wasn't really safe for us to go out and pick strawberries. So I had to kind of recreate the experience from home. And it was a really great opportunity to play with how bright and colorful alcohol markers can be, the intense colors that they can bring to your illustrations while also bringing in some watercolor. In fact, I had so much fun with this piece on this paper that I've got loads of ideas. It's was such an inspiring experience. Ooh, my mouth is just going a million miles. My brain's going faster than my mouth can keep up and I'm jumbling all my words, but you guys, you guys get it. Anyway, um, that I, I have other pieces in mind that I wanna do in the future. So this was a lot of fun and I feel like I'm gonna be buying a lot of these pads. So now we're done with the alcohol markers. Now it's time to bust out watercolor. And I have some tutorials on using watercolor with alcohol markers, either to extend your collection of alcohol markers or to add shading. And one of the things I really like about using watercolor over alcohol markers is it doesn't reactivate the alcohol. Now I will say, it, sometimes the alcohol does some funny things to the cellulose paper and it kind of changes how the paper absorbs your markers. So you may want to experiment first before you're committed to like the big deal piece that you really care about. But one of the things that I like that a watercolor paper brings to the table in this sort of mixed media application is you can get granulation and you can see the paper texture, which adds a lot of interest. And it adds just like kind of a, an organic feel, a bit of hand of the artist, which you can sometimes lose if you're working entirely in marker. Sometimes when you're working entirely in marker, it starts to feel a little too shiny, a little too flat, maybe a little bit plastic. So I used the watercolor to help build up some of our shadows using contrast colors. They were mixed off camera. You know, I always have kind of a hard time deciding how I want to film my watercolor tutorials because I can basically be so pulled out that you see my palette, you see my mixing palette, and you see the piece, but you can't see anything in detail, or so pulled in that you can see lots of detail and you can see how I'm handling the brush, but you can't see how I'm mixing the colors. So if you guys ever have any questions about either side of the process, whether it's how I'm handling my brush or what brushes I use or how I'm handling my paints and what paints I use and what palettes I prefer, please let me know down in the comments. I'm happy to accommodate, I'm happy to show you, and I do try to use my Saturday art streams to kind of help showcase some of those things where it's a little bit harder to do that in a time-lapse tutorial like this one. But I always wanna hear from you guys and I definitely value your feedback, so please do let me know. Now for the leaves, I'm going in with a really nice 
phthalo blue and I'm starting to build up some of the shadow. On Kara's face, I mixed together a bit of the Quinn magenta up there in the top row with the dioxine purple to create kind of this red violet color that works really well for shading skin. One of the other beautiful things about traditional media, and this is true for digital too, is that you do have the opportunity to go back over things and rework them, add other layers, add other colors. You can tweak and adjust things to suit what you have in your mind or to try something else out. So I'm going over the background again with a, a more saturated wash of ultramarine blue. And I really love Coors ultramarine blue. It doesn't granulate too, too much. And they use Aquazole rather than gum Arabic. So you get this really clean blue. In the past, before I encountered core watercolors, I really didn't like ultramarine blue that much because I kept getting these really muddy yellow ultramarine blues that just weren't that impressive. And I didn't really get what the fuss was about. But after I tried core and then later Sennelier's ultramarine blue, I knew what people were talking about and I was on board with the ultramarine love. So as I'm watercoloring, I'm thinking about going from big to small. Now that includes brushes, but it also includes areas that we're painting. Like you guys saw, I started with the sky and then I started working towards increasingly smaller objects. I start with larger brushes and then I work increasingly towards smaller brushes. And then also as I work, I work from really loose desaturated mixes of color to really saturated mixes of color. So at this point, I used a small Minso brush just to add in some outlines around what I was doing and tighten it up. But now I want to ink it, except I changed my mind and I decided to go back in and just make a couple more tweaks. Now I apologize for my head crossing over the art. My eyesight's pretty poor and I really needed to get all on top of it. So I'm sure you guys understand, especially those of you with poor eyesight in the background, that you gotta squint to see what you're doing. So for this, ideally I wanted to use my Tombow Furunosuke colored brush pins, but I couldn't find them. They'd already been packed up because I was moving when I was recording this. This is actually the last tutorial recorded in my old studio. So what I used instead was a Sakura Pigma FB, which I love, but it's black ink and I did feel like the black ink kind of brought down the liveliness of this piece again. So that's another reason why I wanna get back at it and do some more marker and watercolor pieces on this watercolor round because I love how vibrant the colors are and I wanna play around with my colored inking pens and see if I can maintain that vibrancy while also developing contrast and building up detail. And I love, love, love this pen. The FB stands for fine brush. It is Copic and waterproof. So I could have inked it first and then markered and painted on top of it. So it really frees me up to however I want to do my order of operations. But when I do quote unquote lineless, like this style where I use a colored lead first, it allows me to create a lighter line work because I don't feel the need to line everything. I'm basically just adding in some contrast and delineating areas.
And then finally the gouache, the icing on the cake, the final touches. I'm using a small Minso brush just to apply some white gouache to add in some white highlights here and there. And when you're mixing gouache, you want it to be about the consistency of cream. I know for those of us who don't use gouache often and we're only using it as correction or to add highlights, it's tempting to work with it too thick. But if it's too thick, it globs onto your brush and then you can't actually paint with it. Alright guys, that about wraps it up for this piece. I hope you guys feel as inspired as I do recording the narration and post. I just want to get right back at it and start painting and watercoloring and using markers again. So here we have our sketch. It was done in Pentel Red Lead on the Dora Art watercolor round. Here is our alcohol marker render. You could totally call it at this stage, it looks really good, but I wanted to add just a little bit more. Here it is with some core watercolors on top of it. This was painted using the core mini palette, which is one of my favorite easy go-to palettes to grab. And then here it is after we've added the inks, but have not yet added the gouache highlights. And this was inked using a Sakura Pigma FB. And then finally, we added our white gouache highlights. Thank you guys so much for watching. Hopefully I'll see you guys again soon. Bye guys.